Hi, welcome back to the shop. Um, you might notice that the image quality has changed slightly. I'm experimenting with a new camera. I got a Canon EOS 700D and I will try to use it as a secondary camera and right now I use it as a main camera to get the hang of it so excuse me if some of the video might be out of focus or look wonky. So. Uh, to the topic at hand, I on the lathe I, most, I use most of the time um, high-speed steel and braced carbide, but I also have some inserted tooling, but I try to do as little work with them as I can, because inserts are expensive and I try to keep the number of inserts that I have in my shop as low as possible. Uh, I don't want to have 20 variants of uh, inserts here laying around gathering dust. Um, I have exactly one kind of inserts. These are CCMT0602 with a 0.2 mm nose radius without coating and that's what I use on a lathe for steel, tool steel and also um, aluminum sometimes but for aluminum i prefer high speed steel and i was thinking i could make one or two more lathe tools and maybe even um, a milling cutter that takes this insert there are milling cutters that takes that take ccmt inserts uh, and use the unused edge of the CCMT inserts. They are called recycling cutters and that's a topic that I'm interested in very much because on CCMT inserts you have two main edges which you use on the lathe all the time and you have two edges which are wasted. So let's go to the bench and see what we're up to. Okay, um, these are the inserts I was talking of. Okay, these were the inserts I was talking of and uh, these are CCMT0602 and that means uh, C is the shape which is um, this uh, parallelogram with 80 degrees uh, corner radius and uh, the 06 is the length The length of one of the sides. These are roughly six millimeters when you measure, measure them properly on the microscope. And um, as you can see they are uncoated and that's how I like my inserts. Because the coating produces um, a, co um, a rounding of the, of the cutting edge and that need that uh, increases the cutting pressure and on light machines like I run you don't want much cutting pressure because it's only causing problems. Um, this is a standard facing and turning tool for these inserts. Pretty standard 8mm shank. Um, the screw for, the, for these inserts is an M2.5 screw um, with a Torx head. These little buggers are super expensive. They cost real money. Um, you can buy them one at a time or in p uh, packs of 10 and you really have to put down some money to get these. So don't lose them. And here I have one of my boring bars also for the CCMT0602 inserts. This is a, uh, a Mitsubishi carbide, uh, a Mitsubishi boring bar. It's a steel boring bar, but it's it's fine. It has a 10 millimeter shank. Yeah, it's 10 millimeter shank. And here are again the inserts. Um, Garant is the uh, house brand of my tool supplier. Uh, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty decent quality. Um, CCMT 0602. 06 is the length of the side as I showed you, 02 is the thickness and the next two numbers 
are the nose radius that's 0.2 millimeters and the um, the appendix SS is um, the form of the chip breaker up here HP 7015 this is just the grade of carbide they use and uh, 7015 is uh, is a grade for for light turning work and very light interrupted cuts. But what we really want to do is make our own turning tools and uh, maybe even milling cutters that take these inserts and as you can see this turning tool has the pocket in here. Okay, you can see the, the insert pocket here which has the 80 degree corner back here and the corner is relieved. The M 2.5 millimeter thread in here which I have a tap here. Um, and these holders are not really hardened. They are just uh, heat treated to be very tough but not glass hard. And what we're trying to accomplish now is we make a template for the engraving machine so we can machine this pocket uh, without much setup time. We just want to go to the engraving machine, set up the template and then um, mill out this pocket. But for that we need a template of this shape 10 times bigger. Okay, I have a piece of phenolic. This is the, um, the stuff with the linen in it. It's pretty tough and I like it to use as a material for templates. And let's get the light out of the way. We need a strip of about 95 millimeters width. That's our layout, that's all we need. Uh, center hole 6 millimeters, bolt hole 6.5 millimeters. Okay, we're just center drilling on the, uh, drilling on the drill press. Um, first we use a starter drill. There is no real precision in this uh, operation. 5.8 millimeters. And the two outer holes get drilled with a 6.5 millimeter to get some clearance for a drill uh, for a, a clamping stud. Okay, that's the setup on the rotary table. I have a 6mm pin in the center of the rotary table held in a Morse CP2 collet. And I have my two clamping studs out here to hold it all down. And there are two parallels to, to give me clearance from the uh, Morse CP2 collet and also from the table if I have to mill through, which I will have to, to clean up this edge because. This edge doesn't really matter, but I want it to clean up because this is a template I'm going to keep. Next step will be to center the milling machine's spindle over the 6mm board. And there is a little tool I made myself to make indicating easier and faster. Uh, this is my Indicol ripoff. This, I machined this clamp which goes around the, my spindle nose of the milling machine and is held in place with one thumb screw and it holds my regular dial test indicator holder. So I can just clamp it on the milling machine's spindle, center on a bore without disturbing my tool in the machine's spindle. It goes onto the spindle like this, just go over the nose hold it up and clamp it in position and now you have your 
full freedom of move, movement down here to set your dial indicator where you need it. Then you disengage the spindle, the drive, and you can freely rotate your test indicator. I know all the guys that run Bridgeport have one of these, but uh, yeah, now I have one too. Okay, I hawked out the material in the pocket just shy a few millimeters of my layout line and now we can proceed on and machine uh, a proper outer contour of this pocket. So Okay, you see that we have machined out the pocket and I didn't relieve the corners because I'm using anyway a 20 millimeter stylus to follow the contour and to undercut the corners I can just use a smaller stylus and then it will automatically undercut the edges. And um, to compare this is the original CCMT 0602 insert. And this is 10 times as big. So um, this is almost finished. We'll just clean up this edge here and then we're good to go. we have the template finished what can we use it for um, of course to make our own CCMT holders and yeah you can buy them they are not really expensive a CCMT holder in proper quality costs about 40 bucks and they work just fine um, you can also get these neutral ones which can be used for chamfering and so on but they produce a 40 degree chamfer um, and I don't like it. Uh, this is by the way a very very crappy El Cheapo from China and it still works. It, it, it really works. It's um, an inserted tooling holder there's not much to it it's a piece of steel with the cutout in front so uh, even the cheap ones work even if they look like crap and are finished horrible um, but as I said this one produces 40 degrees chamfers and sometimes you don't want this you don't you want a 45 degree chamfer as it's common and I made this one on the pentagraph machine. Um, it's a bit hard to tell on camera, but you see that the insert is rotated five degrees to give me to to make this edge forty five degree to the work to the axis of the machine. Um, so you can use this to do a proper chamfer and you can't buy a tool like this and they don't sell these and another benefit uh, over this stylus you can use it for facing and for turning and for chamfering so three uses two uses oh, or maybe one and a half uses because you can't really chamfer do a proper 45 degree chamfer with it. I think this is more useful and I have a few pieces of tool steel here. This is a 10 millimeter square stock and I want to make some tools like this. Better finished of course because this was only a test piece. 
So let's go to the bandsaw, cut them to length. I want to make them 8mm shank. Um, 8mm shank with um, about the length as the commercial one. So, so these get um, so these can be used on small machines. There we go. Okay. Uh, right now I'm roughing down the material to 8x8 mm square and I'm using a Iskar 12 mm roughing end mill. In fact, I never used one of these end mills. They have alternating style flutes. One flute is the classic roughing geometry with the corn cob uh, cutting edge. It's a serrated cutting edge which breaks the chip very short. And the other one is a, is a normal straight um, uh, cutting edge. And this should leave when you're assembling a pretty good finish, but also um, give you high, mater high material removal rate. We're just facing off one millimeter, so this doesn't matter. But when we're side milling the ends, we will see if the style of end mill leaves a good finish. So let's take the next piece and surface it down. We're running it at 1000 RPM, which produces a nice blue chip. <coughs> and uh, gives a, a pretty good surface finish there. Ooh. Um, yeah, it helps if you engage the gear. Okay, now we're set up to cut them to length. I already faced the first side and I have my vise set up with a stop uh, parallels and I have a, a leaf spring down here that holds the uh, parallels in place and now we have just to clamp the piece down. I have a long T-handled Allen wrench here so I don't have to reach in that much and now we can use our this nice Iskar carbide end mill to face off the ends. And we're running at 1000 RPM again. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody is familiar with this technique. Um, when you're working with parallels, they and you do a repetitive work where you have to open the wires, take out the part. Uh, clamp up the next part and so on and so on. Uh, there is quite a danger of chips getting under the parallel, the parallel dripping over or when you use compressed air to clean out the wires, which is perfectly fine. Uh, you might blow chips under the parallel and that might compromise your accuracy, accu the precision of your work. Um, but of course you, there is a way around it and you just take a leaf spring place it against your parallel and against your movable jaw. And now I have the wise not completely tightened but the parallel is perfectly safe in position and I can change my parts, blow out with compressed air or whatever I want. The parallel is not going to move and uh, I can use my chip brush to clean off the parallel and just work fast. You can buy commercial parallel retainer which look like two bars and have a spring in between them and so on and so on. Uh, I think Kurt makes them and uh, some of the other major Weiss manufacturers. But really, we are machinists. That's stuff we can make in 50 seconds ourselves. Take a piece of one millimeter spring steel gauge stock or something like that, cut it off on the bench grinder, bend it, <laughs> take off the sharp corners, 
and use it. Saves heck a lot of a time and is way cheaper than the commercial alternative. So don't buy everything they try to sell you. <laughs> um, if, you're wi if you have parts that are wider and you have a second parallel in here, yeah, second parallel here, you can also use a big uh, uh, coil spring. And you can use a spring like this. Uh, just drop the spring in here and this will hold your parallels in place while you're working. But most of the time for the work I do, the leaf spring works very well. <laughs> uh, another trick when you use the leaf spring and you need greater range, you can just drop in a piece of material or a parallel or something like that, and that will also give you a wider clamping range. So be creative, use what you have at hand, and um, what also works well is the steel strapping that are um, when when they um, pack up pallets and you have the steel strapping around, keep some of it around. It's pretty. It's not really spring steel, but it has some spring to it, so it's also very useful and it's free. So, yeah, don't buy the commercial parallel reta retainer. Okay, I'm over at the pantograph machine and. I have the first two of the insert holders already cut and it works very well. I have a 2mm 3 flute carbide amp mill in here. I'm running it at I think 6000 rpm and I'm cutting the, the insert pocket in two steps, 0.25mm deep each time to a total depth of 2.5mm. Yeah, so let's do the next one. And same here, I have a leaf spring in the vise to keep my parallel in place. And uh, I get this parallel out of a, on a flea market and it's magnetic and it's a real pain because everything tends to stick to it. But I have right now no means to demagnetize it. So let's drop in the next part, clamp it, knock it down, and we're good to go. This shop magically lets uh, pens disappear. So let's take some bluing to the surface and take a very shallow pass. Okay, and that's how big the pocket for the insert is going to be. Now, While we have the setup in the pentagraph machine, we can do the, the relief cut in the corner. And we're just going to use the same 2mm end mill and plunge down in the corner. I didn't include 
the uh, relief in the template uh, for the for the pocket because when you go into a sharp corner with an end mill you get into situations where you have full engagement and that tends to chatter so I prefer to plunge this out And the pantograph is of course locked for this operation. Okay, here are R5 um, indexable tools and as you can see the, the CCMT0602 insert fit already into the corner and the cutting edges, the cutting corners are already proud of the, the body of the tool we, but we need to cut away this corner um, to get access to this cutting edge so we can do chamfers with it uh, and do it doing this on the milling machine because it's convenient <laughs> Okay, one important step is to slightly lower the top surface around the insert so the the edge of the insert is proud of it, of the tool holder. Otherwise, um, when you screw down the insert, the edge might chip because it gets side pressure and um, the the edge of a carbide insert is not very robust, so it might chatter and. To prevent this, we lower the surface by two tenths of a millimeter, and because it's convenient, we're running it at the same setup as as this chamfer down here, just uh, using the same end mill and the same setting on the vise. Just drop the part in against the stop. Knock it down. There we go. Okay, uh, right now we're machining the shank down to eight millimeters square, like this one. I did this one already. And we have this uh, two to go. So we clamped up in the vise. Clamped up in the vise against the stop. Tighten the vise and make sure it's down on the parallel. Set our depth of cut. We're taking a uh, 1.9 millimeter cut. To rough it away, then we take a 0.1 millimeter finishing cut. There we go. That's material removal for the shank. I think this was pretty much the last milling operation on these tool. Okay, now we're locating the hole for the insert screw and I took one of my inserts and I super glued it into position into the, the holder. Now we can clamp the holder with the insert and the wise and we will set up our dial test indicator and pick up that hole of the insert and then we will um, break this insert loose from the super glue. It will go out just with a light tap of the copper drift and then we can send a drill, a drill and tap the 
screw. Okay, I have the dial test indicator set up over the bore and already centered on it. And uh, my new Indical rip-off holder for the spindle nose of the machine is quite nice. I, I really like it. And now we zero out our DRO and we're ready to drill our uh, to, to, to center drill and drill the, the hole for the thread. Oh, one thing, um, the screw hole on the inserts um, is always set back about 500 millimeter up to one tenth of a millimeter against the walls of the pocket. So when you tighten down the screw, the, the tapered head of the screw will draw the uh, the insert into the the corner and we will do that. We will move the table 500 uh, Yeah, set it one tenth of a millimeter out of axis So we're drilling uh, Closer to the walls of the insert pocket And get rid of that insert. This is a, a worn-out insert. So Uh, I don't worry too much about breaking it. And the super glue held just good enough to, um, to, to center on the bore of the insert, but not good enough to withstand a, a light uh, percussive uh, hello from my copper drift. Okay, center drilling. And drilling the 2.1 millimeter uh, tap hole. Some cutting off. Okay, there we go. I tapped this one off camera with. 2.5 millimeter thread and I mounted a new insert into it and as you can see it's it looks quite good it's it looks like a real lathe tool uh, the insert is nicely pressed against the edges of the um, of the pocket wall pocket of the insert pocket because we offset the screw 0.1 millimeter and yeah I have to finish them round all the edges over and harden them, but apart from that they are finished. Um, now we can go to the lathe and I will show you the three main usages of this tool. Okay, we're up at the, over at the lathe. I have a piece of, uh, this is free cutting high strength steel, something like stress proof or should be about the same. I have the lathe tool with a new insert in here and First we're going to turn on all the diameter. Then we can chamfer the work. We can face it. Of course, um, the surface finish and the cutting speeds and so on and so on have nothing to do with the tool hole itself. It's all in the insert the grade of carbide, the, tape of, uh, the type of coating, and the geometry of the, of the insert. The holder itself does nothing more than hold the insert uh, in the right position. So this is a three-purpose CCMT holder for turning, for chamfering, and facing, and it does 
45 degree chamfers like you would expect from a tool. Um, that, and the 45 degree chamfer is what's most of the time desired, not a 40 or 30 degree chamfer. So I think there is, uh, I think there is some, some market for this tool because something like this for small lathe does not exist. For bigger lathes you have the SCMT inserts which are uh, square and you have two holes which do exactly the same as this one. They chamfer, they face and they turn but they are very big. The smallest start with a shank cross section of 12 by 12 millimeters and for a small lathe like mine this is too big so um, I made these with 8x8 and I'm pretty sure I can make these also with 6x6 millimeters. Thank you for watching. See you next time.